Chicago welcome. Yeah. yeah. The only thing warm in Chicago. <laughs> Thank you. So apparently you know who this is. Yeah. Let's give them an official warm welcome from Chicago. So, Mark, let's jump into it. I know time is limited. Um, I, did, I saw the movie last night on Ash Wednesday, which I thought was really appropriate. Loved it. I think it's a terrific film. You're going to enjoy what you see. Uh, let's just jump into it. I understand that you ran into this character, intersected with this character, Stuart Law, at a dinner at Beverly Hills. Is that correct? Could you maybe talk about it a little bit about that? Yeah, I was, uh, I was having dinner. This is, this sounds like a bad joke. I was having dinner with two priests at an Italian restaurant. <laughs> Start to a, a bad joke, but I was. And uh, one priest who's in his 90s, just really, it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He wanted to eat his fish and his pasta and have his glass of wine and get back to the rectory and go to bed. And the other priest kept pitching me on a movie idea. And I was like, I don't know if you really are qualified to pitch me. But he is, a, you know, he's, he's young and... Um, he has great taste in films, but he was t telling me the story, and he started telling me a second time, and something that he said resonated with me. So I said, do me a favor, just start from the top. And he told me about a priest who, uh, a, a, an incident with the priest who had a woman who was a very big contributor to the parish. Um, Stu was pretty well into his illness by that time, and he had a long line of people waiting to talk to him because he was always brutally honest with people, and he could relate to people. He had real life experience. He had been on both sides of it, and he really knew what he was talking about. He told people the, the honest truth. And so this woman basically cut the line. Stu was just trying to wash his face, and his dad was there, and he just changed him. And uh, the woman stormed past everybody, and she goes, I need to talk to you right now. And he just kind of looks at her, and she's like, you know, these SOBs, they broke my window. They stole my computer. And he goes, wait a second. You've been an asshole since the day I met you. <laughs> you know what? Those guys probably needed it a lot more than you do. So you know what you should do? Make another contribution, and you should pray for them. And next time, wait in line like everybody else. And I just thought, oh, tell me more about this guy. <laughs> I was like, this guy is interesting. I had somebody who was uh, of the cloth who was very instrumental in my childhood. And I met him the first time. It was at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was 13 years old. I had a beer in my hand. And I was probably smaller than my 12-year-old daughter. And this guy was shocked to see me out there. Um, but we were kind of left to our own devices. And so uh, when I met him, he didn't grab me by the ear and drag me home to my parents and tell them what I was doing. He kind of stayed out there and talked to me and wanted to know what I was doing while I was out there. And he always remained very close to me. And when I got in trouble and I followed all the wrong people and I made poor choices, he was always there. He would be the one to come and see me. So he was the one who pointed me in the right direction. And then I realized there were other key people around me who were really positive influences in my life and in my faith. I just didn't recognize them as opposed to the cool guy in the corner or the guy who had the nice car. I was, you know, looking, looking for acceptance and approval and validation in the wrong places. And so that's kind of why I said, you know what, I need to make this movie. Uh, this movie is a beginning of my journey to continue to do more of God's work and continue to promote Stu's message and make sure that his voice is not only heard in Helena, Montana, but everywhere else. And we need this right now more than ever. You know, there is so much division. We need to bring people together and we need to make sure that people know that we're not forgetting about them, that we love them and we support them, and that nobody is beyond redemption if they're willing to really change. Uh, and that's pure. And people repent and do the right thing. And, you know, we, people are in, right now especially, are losing hope and losing faith. And we want to encourage people to come back. And Stu dealt with so many very difficult things with, with dignity and grace. And, and uh, it was something that I just felt compelled to make. Mm. One of the things that's so interesting about his story is that the physical suffering actually deepened 
his inner journey to faith. Could you talk a bit about that and how that may have attracted you to the Yeah, world? I mean, he, he, he dealt with it in such a profound, beautiful way. Um, he was, his whole life was really predicated on his physical attributes. You know, he was a fighter. He had lost a younger brother uh, at a very young age and his parents didn't know how to cope. So they basically left him to his own devices and they coped in the best way that they knew how, with drinking and kind of, you know, just parents aren't supposed to better their children. So he was left to his own devices. He really uh, resented his parents, especially his dad, because of that. Uh, but his dad was also able to redeem himself later, where he came and cared for him and nurtured him uh, the way he did when he was a child. You know, I mean, he literally had to feed him and change his diapers and do all the things for him that he neglected to do early on. Um, and his dying wish was that his parents would get baptized. And these are parts of the story that aren't in the film that I wanted to share with you guys. So. You know, one of his proudest moments was him laying in the church with the bishop who ordained him, and he was laying on a gurney, and his parents were being baptized, and he was laying there with tears of joy in his eyes. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, but he, he, he really, he felt like because of all the things that he had experienced and, and all the hardships that he had gone through, that he really deserved more, and he felt like it was a blessing, and it brought him closer to God. And, you know, I think it gives me comfort because having watched my, my dad deteriorate in the same way that Stu did, and my mom die recently, and literally deteriorate in front of me uh, in a very, very short amount of time, it gave me comfort to know that there is something better and that that pain will go away <laughs> and that there will be happiness. And I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but there will be, what there, be like? there will be peace and comfort. And I believe in heaven. That gives me great comfort to know. And... You know, the one thing that's inevitable is our mortality and how you handle that. And some people get to live a long life. Even a long life is still a very short time if you experience love and joy and happiness at, at any level. So uh, to see how he handled that and how he really gives a lot of people comfort. I said to an audience who was, is, was about to see the movie, and I promised them, I said, this will touch you in one way or another. I promise you that. And everybody, there were some people you could tell they were a little bit cynical. And they came to me after and they were like, I was talking to everybody, and like, you know, when you set that up, I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's not going to bother me. And she's like, oh my God, I didn't realize I lost my brother. And then somebody else said, oh, I hadn't talked to my dad for such a long time. I had to text him the second I walked out of the theater just to know that, tell him that I love him. And he called me back right away. And he always felt like even if he reached out and he extended the olive branch, his dad wouldn't respond because his dad was disappointed in some of the choices that he was making, you know. And, and that also helped me, too, just him sharing that with me in knowing how to deal better with my children and the choices they make. You know, they come into life, this is their life, you just want to kind of teach them, guide them, protect them, but point them in the right direction, hope they make good choices, and at the end of the day, they're just good people. And I um, you know, certainly wanted to just give them a better life and a better opportunity than what I had. And, uh, you know, that's why I do so much in giving back to places like the place I came from, because there are a lot of kids who are at a disadvantage. Um, and I want them to know that if I could be successful and overcome all the things that I went through, that there isn't any reason that they can't. And throughout all of the stuff that's going on, all the negativity that's in the world, there is a lot of positive and a lot of hope in young people bringing us together and great leaders being right here in this room and somebody connecting with somebody else and bringing people together, you know? Because if, if we keep going the way we're going, it's just gonna get worse and worse. So to bring people together to share love experience and you know let people know that they, they're cared for and loved that's a, that's a very important thing uh, one of the things that I thought was so impressive I mean Sony's distributing this movie mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's rare to see a major studio have a movie in which these big questions are asked and this movie has the big ones like why yeah. why did this happen to me why did God let this happen you know, how did that impact you in terms of dealing with the story as an actor uh, you know, it was one of those things where when I started to present the screenplay to people, nobody got, they didn't recognize the humor in it. I actually, I met with uh, resistance at every step of the way, oddly enough. Um, I sent it to some of the people who were instrumental in Stu's life and the church, uh, and they were resistant to it because of some of the language in the first couple of pages. And I'm like, people say the F word. People say shit. People, that's pe people speak that way doesn't mean that they should be judged or condemned because they may say bad words. This is, this is just how pe some people communicate. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're, we could make a movie that's preaching to the choir and it doesn't really move the needle and it doesn't bring anybody else 
to their own faith or, or to God or to Jesus or whatever it is. Or you can make a movie that really challenges everybody and is for everybody. And everybody can get something out of it, which is what we wanted to accomplish. But people didn't recognize the human in the story. And they also felt like it was dark and depressing because here's this guy going through all this trouble. And then he gets sick. And then, but there's so much hope. And now people, after they're seeing it, they're like, oh my God, this is such an uplifting story. But I had a plan in place for a very long time. And one, to get the movie made. Then when I realized nobody wanted to finance it, I was going to have to finance it myself. That's when shit gets real. <laughs> okay? It's one thing as an actor, a studio takes a swing with you. you know, they pay you to make a movie. It's another thing when you're actually paying yourself. You start paying attention to all the little details. Trust me. So I, I had a friend, uh, Josh Greenstein, who is he's the head of the motion picture department at Sony. Before that, he was at Paramount with me. We made The Fighter together. We made many, many great movies together. Um, and so, you know, he's been making Spider-Mans and Uncharted and all these movies that are hugely successful, but this is a big IP and it's, it's an easier sell for him. And this is something that's a big challenge, but also it's so much more rewarding, right? This is where he can show what he can do. I can show what, what I want to do and the messages that I want to put out there and the movies that I want to make. So he and I are golf buddies and we hang out. So I was constantly planting the seed with him from a very early part of the process when I had the screenplay and then we started shooting and I'd show him little vignettes and everything else. And then uh, he had to go um, to Tom Rothman and the rest of the heads of the studio. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I tried to, uh, to slowly plant the seed and get them to distribute the movie. And you know, this is, again, they really recognized right away that this is a movie for everybody. So they like to make jokes about how you know those they're my Jewish brothers and here they are promoting this very Catholic movie and uh, and so I wanted to show it to all of my Jewish brothers, my Muslim brothers, all of my friends that I that I really consider family and show them the movie and show them how this was really a movie for everybody. Yeah, it really is a humanistic film too. Uh, let's talk about production a bit because it was 40, 40 days, is that right? 30 days. 30 days. 30. And you have 40 of, days, we could have done two of them. <laughs> <laughs> got a sequel. Yeah. Uh, 30 days and no break, and you gained a lot of weight. Yeah, that. so maybe talk yeah. a bit about that whole process. Yeah, I didn't want to do the whole oh, actor, it's oh, I gained weight and I lost weight. I did this, I walked around in an accent for a year and a half. <laughs> I even still think I'm in the movie. It all sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, how are you going to outdo somebody like that, right? It's like, okay, well, I waited for 10 years. I stood on, you know, I slept on a bed of needles. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, it's acting at the end of the day. But it was such an important part of Stu's story and Stu's journey because he relied so much on his physicality. You know, I mean, everything was predicated on his physical abilities. And when he started to lose that, the way he transitioned and the way the disease took hold of him so rapidly um, and all of that, he really lost all of that. Everything else was stripped away, but his spirit was soaring, and his connection and his dedication and commitment to service to God was unwavering. You know, no matter what he faced, um, and you know, with the loss of his brother, and then him, and was still then able to convince his parents. And he still, the amazing thing was when I talked to the archbishop, who had also when I talked about you know doors being closed, they were upset about the language in the film. Studios didn't want to make the movie, but when I showed him the movie. And when I was talking to him about it, he said Stu did more in his four years, four short years of service than the bishop felt he did in his 40 years of service. And he still felt like if he served for the rest of his life, he could not match the impact that Stu made on the people that he met and that he came across. And so that was really, really uh, touching to me. So I wanted to kind of show that. That is an important part of the story. That's not like an actor saying, okay, I'm just going to go and eat. I felt like shit, excuse my language, I still feel terrible. I don't recommend anybody do it, especially at 50 years old. It's just not healthy. <laughs> um, I thought I'd be eating cake and ice cream, and I was eating like four bowls of white rice, a dozen eggs, 12 pieces of bacon, two steaks, and drinking a glass of olive oil. It's terrible. And then you're still full. And three hours later, you're eating another meal and consuming 11,000 calories a day for four weeks. And most of it's like starch, and then it's just two weeks of starch, two weeks of sodium, and then the first two weeks is just like, you know, high proteins and stuff like that. It was not, not fun. So many touching moments in the movie. There's one at a bar where he meets a stranger and the guy says, there's, you go through life and there's so many reasons that you can have a gut full of anger, but only, you only need one reason. Yeah. To, could you maybe talk a bit about 
was that in the script? Did, was it, was that line was in the script. Yeah, so we did we did improvise a lot in the movie, but Razan Ross wrote an amazing screenplay. And as I was telling you earlier, I was trying to make this movie early on with David Russell, who I had made the fighter with, I.R. Huckabee's Three Kings, um, and you know he just the first script that we got didn't work. He didn't have the same sense of urgency that I had to go make the movie. So I said I'm going to go elsewhere. If I find something or somebody, I'll come back to you. If it works out, if not, I'm going to do my thing. And then uh, I talked to Rosalind Ross, and she said she wanted to take a crack at it. She had written something else that I really liked. And so I told her the story, and I left to go shoot a movie. I come back three months later, and she handed in this amazing screenplay that I actually wanted to make, which is pretty much the version of the movie that you see now. We made some changes and some you know, some rewrites and work on the script, but not a lot. And, uh, and then I just thought she was so good at putting it on the paper that she would be able to put it on the screen as well. So I said, we give you a shot at writing it, why don't we give you a shot at you know, your directorial debut? And here we are discovering a massive talent. Her and I are about to make a movie now again after this. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So, you screenwriting students and directing students, I think you want to really uh, pay attention to yeah. this. It's very, very well And the other, the other thing, so that, that saying there, right, you'll, you'll find all these reasons. I always say the same thing to everybody else. You can find a million excuses not to outwork everybody else. Right, not to live up to your full potential. If you find one good reason to want to do it and make it happen, and that is very powerful. You'd be unstoppable. Whatever you decide you want to do, you will be unstoppable. You know, but unfortunately, there's a lot of excuses come up, and lots of reasons to not pursue your dream. To you know, to not go and try to you know bring your idea to fruition. You know, you got to take those kind of chances. You got to go out and make it happen. So, what? One last question. Uh, a lot of these filmmakers out here, young filmmakers, uh, what words of advice would you have for them? Maybe something inspired by uh, Father Stu. Anything that you want to share with them? Other than well, what you first of all, write something and give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll produce it. I'll make it happen. I think we need great voices. You know, we need new and interesting stories and people to tell them. You know, there are no rules. There's no rules. You know, finding finding your own voice and really trusting your instincts and trusting your taste. Um, you know, Stu would really love film. Obviously, he went to LA. He tried to become an actor. If you look online, there's wonderfully funny interviews with him quoting Armageddon and all these random movies. And you know, um, the last movie that uh, that they could recall him and his dad seeing in the theater was The Fighter. Oh. Wow. And uh, yeah, him and his dad and a bunch of friends went. And most of the guys that came out of that theater and that group were like shadow boxing and really on an emotional high after the end of the movie. And Stu and his dad were just basically kind of quiet and just kind of kept it to themselves. And and then they realized that, you know, there was so much that they recognized in their own lives and the dysfunction in their family in that movie that it really spoke to them because it's really personal to them. So for me to be able to then tell their story was amazing. But uh, and also finding things that matter to you. You know, I, I think you'll have amazing success with this movie and it's really going to touch people and change people. And it's going to challenge people to do things that will make them better at helping other people. It will definitely, it will definitely make you kind of look in the mirror and say, okay, what am I going to do then? How do I move the needle and just do my part? So uh, yeah, you know, really uh, make sure that your voice is heard and you know, uh, don't take no for an answer. Absolutely. And I, I cannot wait to see what you guys do, what you accomplish. I, like I said, I've been talking to a lot of young people lately. I'm an old guy. 50 years old, I still think I'm young at heart, but I am very optimistic about our future, you know, talking to a lot of these really amazing young people. Yeah. Thanks, uh, enjoy the movie. It comes out April 13th, which gives you some time to spread the word. Let's have a round of applause here. For My crowning achievement in academic <laughs> the last five years. I'm so excited to be able to do that. So please reach out to me and let me know. And uh, if you got an idea, find me. All right, thanks, Ashley. <laughs>